Let's read from verse 1, 2 Corinthians 5, from verse 1. Okay, this is a passage of scriptures. Maybe, maybe not easy. In some ways, there's a lot of things in this, but it's scripture, it's good, it's God's word. Let the word of God speak. So it says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed. So when we look at our body, the, the Bible says that our body is a tent. So that's what it is. It's a temporary dwelling place. The body that we live in is a tent. That means it's a temporary dwelling place. Everyone take a look at their own tent. Okay, some tents look different to others, but that's all the body is. Now, the body is honorable. The body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. But it says, if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So we have a new body waiting for us. It's perfect. It's there on the coat hanger. It's not even got any dandruff on it. It's got no aches and pains in it. It's going to be good. It's going to be perfect. So we have a new body. And verse 2 says, For in this we groan. Every true child of God has an inner groaning. Has an inner pain. Every true born again child of God, every true born again Christian has an inner groaning constantly throughout this earthly life. Uh, and and I believe in positive teaching. I believe in positive preaching. Um, and I don't believe in being glum and being miserable because we've got the greatest hope of all. Jesus. Amen. <laughs> but nevertheless, we can have happy, happy teaching, happy, happy, happy teaching. Amen. But we're always going to have a groan. If you're born of God, there's something in you that it carries a constant ache and a constant pain. Because there's something in you wants to put off this and put on the new. There's a groaning on the, on the inside that desires to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. There's a groaning on the inside that says, you know, we feel the pain of this world. There's a groaning on the inside. And, and, it's, it, it, no, and I believe as we get closer to the return of the Lord... The believing church, and I said the believing church, his church on the earth, the groaning is going to intensify. Okay? And it's a groaning for Jesus. It's to be clothed. And it says, verse 3, If indeed haven't been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent, we groan. We're burdened. Not because we want to be unclothed, or further clothes, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. You know, if you're born of God, on the inside of you is eternal, immortal life. Eternal life is not just go to heaven when you die. Yes, if you're born again, you will go to heaven when you die. Eternal life is the very life of God. The word eternal means that which was, that which is, and that which always will be. Everlasting, perpetual, never-ending life. And the word life is the Greek word zoe. And it means the God kind of life. The God kind of life. The same life that raised up Jesus from the dead. So you have a life in you that always was, always is, always will be. The God life. And that life in you, it's already in you. But we're not, we haven't got a new resurrection glorified body yet. So there's a groaning. Okay, and, uh, and it goes on to say, Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given the Spirit, this is the, this is the key line, who has given the Spirit as a guarantee. God has given us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. In the King James translation, it says as an earnest. And this means as a down payment. That's what the word literally means. 
the Holy Spirit has been given to you as a down payment. And that down payment, you have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. And God has given you the down payment of the Spirit to say he's, he's purchased you, you're his. And he's going to get you home. But it's also a down payment to you. Because you're not yet home. And you live in a world that's full of sin, that's glum, that is, is getting, the world is getting worse by the day. Come on, it is. And yet we're getting closer to the return of Jesus, praise God. And we've been given this earnest of the Spirit, this down payment to give us a little foretaste of heaven before we get there. Hallelujah. It's kind of like, you know, I've got a heart for leads. Who has a heart for leads? You know, I mean, who would say leads us aesthetic, on a scale of one to ten, aesthetically pleasing? Where would you rate leads? Any, any, any takers? Out of ten. All right, all right. Start again. Middlesbrough on a scale of one to ten. I mean, bless anyone from Middlesbrough. As I'm driving up the A19 to uh, visit my family, we drive, we drive through Middlesbrough. God bless Middlesbrough. Anyone from Middlesbrough? On a scale of 1 to 10, aesthetically pleasing, Middlesbrough would be a little bit not so high. So what about Leeds? A 7. 7 and a half. 7 and a half. Not bad, yeah. All right, there's some nice parts of Leeds. What about just outside a church here? Three. Three. A 3. It's not so good, is it? We've had a few weddings here before, and I thought, it's not really a wedding photograph. <laughs> no. It's in the wedding pictures outside. <laughs> and, and it's like this, like we're living in a world that, you know, just outside of church here, let's face it, when you drive down York Road to come here, it's a little bit glum. And then we come outside of church, and some people have commented that outside looks like a supermax prison. You know, the corrugated uh, yeah. <laughs> metal outside, it, it, it's not too pretty. And that's all right. You know, I, I, I mean, Leeds for me, I think it's about a five or a six. So I, I think I think Newcastle is actually a very beautiful city. It really is. But, uh, you know, imagine this. We're living in a glum world, but we've been given a down payment of somewhere beautiful. So imagine, imagine like we're, we're living in a place that it's a bit like outside of here. It's, come on, this part of Leeds, outside of here, it's a little bit, it looks a bit glum. Or imagine you could just go to the Maldives every weekend. <laughs> imagine you could just have a long weekend in the Maldives. You didn't have a 10 hour flight. You could just have that. That's like a down payment of what's to come. I've never been. Has anyone ever been to the Maldives? I've never been. It looks nice. All right, then. Malaga. <laughs> it's okay. All right, we'll go down, and go down a few notches. Skeggy. All right, okay, we're getting somewhere. So it's kind of like, you know, we live in a glum place. But you imagine you could just have a weekend in the Maldives. Oh, it doesn't look amazing. The, the hotels that are, the hotel rooms that are built over the sea. And you come out of your hotel room and there's a slide straight into the sea. You know, pray that there's no sharks around, of course. But yes, who's ever been in a beautiful place? I remember it, yeah? I remember a few years ago, our, our apostle blessed us and he paid for us to have a, a, a week and a half in Miami, which was rather nice. But that's a nice blessing that, isn't it? <laughs> to have flights and accommodation in, in South Florida, paid for and spent time with him. But during that time, we just drove down to the Florida Keys. I just remember we were just lying on this beach in the Florida Keys. Please don't picture that milk bottle white English one. Um, and it's just like, absolutely Beautiful. It's just this beat Scarborough <laughs> any day. Just a bit. It's just stunning. And it's you lie in there, it's so warm. And the sea, the sea's warm. And it's just beautiful. You just imagine it back home, back home, just drizzly grey weather, and it's just absolutely beautiful. And you're just thinking, wow. So it's look, look, we're in this world, and it's a it's glum. And it's, it's dark. 
but we've been given an earnest of the Spirit. It's kind of like someone said, look, you can just come to the Maldives anytime you want. Get away from this drab sort of grayish, you know, northern England. And there you are on that beautiful beach. You know, wow. God has given us an earnest of the Spirit as a down payment of heaven into us. He's given us a little spot of heaven in your spirit. And when we gather together and worship and his presence is here, there's an earnest of the spirit among us. That's why it's so important to be church and gather together, be a house of God, be a house of prayer. Jesus said, my house will be a house of prayer. And, and there's an ache, listen, there's an ache and a groaning on the inside of us for the full thing. It's like, you know, if you've been working all year and you've got a holiday booked to um, Tenerife, you're like, oh, I can't wait just to get there. There's a groaning on the inside of you for that last Friday when you just, you've got two weeks. <laughs> that's how people in England live, isn't it? Really, that's how people live. But we have a groaning and an aching on the inside of us and we've all, we've been given the down pain and we're getting the full thing. And this is how, this is why the, the Holy Spirit is so precious. The Holy Spirit and his gifts are so precious. His prayer language is so precious. The prayer language the Holy Spirit has given to us. Now if we go to Romans chapter 8, and the Apostle Paul picks up a very similar theme here. Very similar to what he has just said in, in, in 2 Corinthians 5. And from verse 18, he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So whatever we go through in this life is nothing. It's like nothing compared to what's coming. And, and like the glory, wow. I mean, God has said in his word, he, he, he's going to glorify us. I mean, I, I don't, God, I'm not worthy of that. <laughs> you want to glorify me? <laughs> It's a staggering. It's just utterly when we consider what God in Christ has done, how God in Christ has chosen you to be the eternal object of his affection forever. It's a staggering. It's mind-blowing. It's like, Lord, why? And he'll just say, because I want to. And that's a good enough response, isn't it? And, and so... There's a glory that's going to be revealed in us. And verse 19 says, For the earnest expectation of the creation awaits for the revealing, the manifestation of the sons of God. There's coming a day when we're going to put off the old. I want to just very briefly, um, who's aware that in the scriptures there are yet to be filled, there are yet to be fulfilled prophecies? The rapture, the tribulation period, Amen. the uh, this yet to be fulfilled prophecies in Scripture, and and this one here is one of my favourites in one Corinthians fifteen fifty one, and this ties in with what Paul's just been saying about the revealing of the sons of God. This is when it happens. Is it behold? I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. Now, let's just say that more plainly. We're not all, the Bible here says, we're not all going to die. But we shall all be changed. Hallelujah. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised and corrupt, incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. The Bible saying here, this has not yet been fulfilled. There's a generation that's going to be on the earth who won't even experience the first death. Wow. I mean, thank God we've been delivered from the second death. And, but the first death, every Christian up until this point has experienced the first death, has fallen asleep in the Lord. There's coming a people on the earth who, who are not going to die. That's the people who are alive at the return of Jesus. And they put on immortality. 
And I just carry a conviction on the inside of me that I, I believe the Lord is coming soon. I am not saying I'm, please, I am categorically not saying I'm never going to die. I'm immortal. But I believe Jesus is coming soon, so I have a hope that I'm going to be here when Jesus returns. And so I, I can have, be free of a death mentality. Hallelujah. Isn't it, isn't it amazing just to never die? You, you, I mean, come on, death sucks. Woody Allen says, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> well, Woody, you need to get born again. You know, look, look, praise God for the born again saints who have fallen asleep in the Lord. But I, I tell you, I don't want to die. Full stop. I, I just want to step straight into immortality. I, I mean, it's, it's there in the Bible. Who wants to believe for it? Come on, hallelujah. Just go like that. That's how quick it will be. It's like nuclear energy straight from energy, straight from heaven. Bam! Just caught up in the spirit. Glory airlines. Hold your tray table up, put your, put your seatbelt on. Bam! We're out of here. No more death. You won't even die the first death. That's how glorious our future is. Praise the Lord. I believe he's coming soon. You know, listen, I don't want to sound weird. But I, 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 I keep off social media. But I saw the clip of Elon Musk's robots. And, and I... I just, I thought this is science fiction, this is a movie. It's not real robots walking like this. And they were just one after the other, one after the other, one after the other. And if you're rich, you can buy one for 30k. I wouldn't have one of them in my house if you paid me. I ain't gonna, I, hey, listen, if you have Alexa in your house, like, get rid of it. Listen, take Alexa and get rid of it. <laughs> you don't want stuff like that. Anyway, no go on there. Uh, but, listen, I saw this video of these robots. And it's 2024 now. I just felt in my spirit, 10 years from now, where's this tech going to be? Oof. There's coming a day when we won't have human policemen. We won't have human soldiers. It'll be that stuff. And that's, honestly, and I just felt that I'm not being weird, but we are literally on planet Earth at a time in history a bit like when we went from the windmill to the first steam train. Like a time, there's an acceleration coming upon the earth. And the word of God says in the end times, you'll greatly increase, knowledge will greatly increase. And it has. But there's coming a thrust, I just feel it, there's coming a thrust, a massive thrust in the next, even in the rest of this decade, and in the 2030s, there's coming this massive movement of tech and of knowledge. And we're going to have to specify what will AI do, what will this do. It's all heading in the direction of Antichrist. I mean, if AI is not Antichrist, I mean, what is it? <laughs> the fact is, we don't need to focus on that. Look, Jesus is coming soon. Look at the Middle East. Even now, Turkey's talking about invading Israel. It's there in the Bible, they're going to. Look at all, look at it. We just, just have to wake up. And we don't have to be weird and conspiracy minded. But Jesus is coming soon. And so if, he, if he's coming soon, hallelujah, I get to not die. <laughs> just step into life. Now, I don't take life for granted. And, and, you know, every day, I don't, you know, I don't take life for granted. God is God. But I have a, this, this, that's an unfulfilled prophecy. There's a generation on this earth going to be here who don't even taste the first death. Glory to God. And you know, I think this, I think it's easier to die than it is to live. It takes faith to live. You've got to fight to live. Hallelujah. So he says, the earnest expectation of the creation, back to Romans chapter 8, verse 19, is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Now let's get into this. Verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with 
birth pangs together until now. What's this saying? The very creation, the earth is groaning. The creation itself is under bondage. And, and we are groaning. We read that in 2 Corinthians 5. That in every true child of God, there is a groan. There's an ache. You can have even the best things of this life. We could sit on the teaching about having your best life now. Being the best version of you. Hallelujah. And I believe in the blessing. I believe in godly prosperity. We could have all of that. But if we're walking with Jesus, there's going to be a groan and an ache on the inside of you. We could have the best spouse. We could have the best family. We could have everything. We could have a beautiful home, beautiful wife, husband, all that sort of stuff. But if we walk with Jesus, there's an ache. There's a groan. as part of being poor in spirit. And the very earth itself is groaning. And so a lot of these disasters that are going to be happening... Now, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to get into the climate sort of thing. But the earth is groaning. As we get closer to the return of the Lord, the earth is going to groan more and more and more. We're going to see it. But, and it says, verse 23, this is taking the same thought from 2 Corinthians 5. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit. That's a similar thought. We've got the down payment of the Spirit. We've got the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Is there anybody here you know a groan on the inside of you? You know an ache, you know a pain on the inside of you. It's not just, oh Lord, take me home. Look, there could have been times in your Christian life when you've gone through some trials and you've just gone, oh Lord, take me home. We've probably all been there. At times, but there's, there's something more. We want to be clothed with immortality. We want to be clothed with the glory of God. We want to be, we, we want to break out of just this sense realm. We want more. We want Him. We, we've got the down payment. We've got the earnest of the Spirit, a little spot of heaven on the inside of our heart that we know that we know on our worst day. On our very worst day, someone puts a gun against our head. We know Jesus is Lord because we have the earnest, the down payment of the Spirit. We know we've experienced little glimpses of heaven in his presence. And that causes us to ache, causes the inner pain, the inner groaning. And it's like we have to live in this world. Not only that, we have to live in these bodies. And the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And throughout church history, there's been leaning, theological leanings towards our, anything to do with the body is unclean, unholy. Uh, and people of extreme ascetic, um, well, I won't say that, I can't remember that. You know what I mean? And it's like, no, the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, but it's not yet glorified. It's like, listen, someone expressed like this. If you know who you are in Christ, you're living in an old body. Effectively, you're living in a cage. Your body is like a prison. Your spirit wants to put this clothing off and put on the new. The inner nature on the inside of you wants out of this prison and to put on Christ. To fully put on Christ, to fully be clothed. With the new. And we can't even conceive of what it is yet. We want the new. It's up there on the coat hanger. It's perfect. And, and it's even the body we have. And all, all the sins we've committed. We've been forgiven. And the Bible says that our whole spirit, soul and body is to be sanctified. But our body has a propensity for sin. Temptations for sin come through our flesh. Our body gets sick, it gets it aches, it gets pains. And so, and, and in our body, we're trapped in the sense realm. Through these eyes, through these ears. And it's like, there's a sense of constrainment, a containment on human beings. We, it's almost like human beings have an innate memory and, and a collective memory of our race 
the human race once lived in paradise. Once lived in paradise. Once lived in a place of perpetual beauty and love and there was no hate. There was no violence. There was no poverty. There was no starvation. There was no loneliness. Everything was perfect and then something went wrong. And then they realized they were naked and they felt ashamed. Human beings, we carry that on the inside. You know, I remember as a little boy, I had a... Who remembers if you had a, a children's Bible? Who had a children's Bible when they were young? And I, you know, I wasn't brought up in a Christian home. I had... A, it wasn't a children's Bible. I had the, the story of Adam and Eve. And it was, it was like pictures. It was really well drawn and I can see it now. And that story was the saddest story. I was only a little child and I, every other story ended with a happy ending. This story ended sad. Seeing the backs of them walking away from paradise. And I'd go back to the beginning and see if it would end happy again. And it never did. I didn't know there was more to the story. Well, that's, there's something in us. There's an ache in the human race to, to try and, you know, utopia, isn't it? <laughs> there's something in us we're not satisfied. Arrgh, there's a groaning on the inside of us. And the more you go for God, we can sit in church and have messages, oh God, look, God wants us to have peace and shalom in our life. It's still going to be a pain and an ache and a groaning on the inside of you. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Praise the Lord. And so we have this. Let's go back to Romans 8. We're eagerly awaiting the adoption, the redemption of our body. Verse 23. We have this groaning within ourselves. We have a groaning, wanting the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see... We eagerly wait for it with perseverance. The New Testament Christian is to have a perseverance to eagerly wait for the adoption of their body, for a new body. Who's looking forward to having a new body? Yeah. Amen. Oh, 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 it's going to be good, isn't it? Oh, hallelujah. We'll, we'll still recognize each other. It's going to be amazing. But meanwhile, we live in the present. As best as things can be, we still live in the present. We live in a world because we, we listen, we interact with this world through what? Through our body. We, we have to live in the world. We're not of the world, but we interact with the world through our eyes, through our ears, through our touch, through our taste. We, we interact with the world through our body. And it's a fallen world where people are trying to destroy each other. Where Satan is trying to destroy everybody. We, you know, we, we live in these bodies. We have a physical brain. You can wake up just feeling like giving up, depressed. Sometimes we struggle with stuff. But we've been given a down payment. We have a down payment. Amen. A little touch of the Maldives. Well, heaven's better than the Maldives. It's going to be better than the Maldives. Glory to God. But, verse 26. After Paul has talked about all of this, how the Christian has an inner ache, an inner pain, to put off mortality and put on immortality, to put off this tent and put on the new, for the full adoption of the body. An ache. Am I the generation that's going to be alive when Jesus comes that steps straight into life? Straight into immortality. No death. We have an ache. Because we live in a world of death. Jesus is the feet of death. But the last enemy to be destroyed, to be put under the feet of Jesus is death. So we still live in a world of death. Our bodies are still, our present bodies are still subject to death. The moods that can affect our mind can be a manifestation of death. The problems in the world and around us, everywhere, is all coming from death. It's all coming from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. It all stems from 
death. Thank God we have the down payment. But this is why Paul says in verse 26, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Excuse me. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses because we live in a world of death. The very bodies which are to be sanctified, temples of the Holy Ghost, still have a propensity. Well, they're going to die unless we're the generation that Jesus comes. So there is a, a sense of death, containment, constrainment, pressures, negativity. So we got the down payment and we've been given something else. The Spirit helps us. And that word help, you have heard the past few weeks, is the word sunanti lambano ahai. I think I've said it right then. And it means to join yourself with, to lift up, to set against. That's what the Spirit does. How? For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In the Greek it means with sounds that don't belong to an earthly language. Now can we see how precious it is to have a prayer language. Uh, look, in the past I've, I've spoke and taught on baptism in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, and I look back and I, honestly I could have maybe done a better job of it. I don't want to alienate people. I do not want to alienate people. I don't want to come across edgy. There are amazing, godly people in the body of Christ who think differently than me. We're called to walk in love, not have strife. All of that. And you could be sat here today, you may think, oh, I'm not sure about tongues, I'm not sure about this. I, I'm, I've got no problem with you. I'm not gunning for you. I'm not, honestly, hand on heart. Because without love, we're a sound and gone. And, and I, I, I probably in the past have come across it a bit <laughs> in that way, and I don't want to alienate people. And, and it could say, in, in the church, because this has been a sensitive, divisive topic, I should be. Well, this is my conviction that this is a central to the Christian life. And this is a holy gift. It's a holy manifestation of the Spirit. Because you've been given the down payment of His presence. That little touch of the Maldives on the inside of you when you're living in middle, a world that's like Middlesbrough. But He wants you to get released in a prayer language. So that, that Middlesbrough atmosphere, you know, sorry, I keep talking, but we, we drive not late drive. <laughs> I'm from up that end, I'm not from, I'm, uh, you've got the Geordies, you've got the uh, the Mackhams and the Smoggies. Smoggies are from Middlesbrough, you see, you hold your breath when you drive up the air 19 because of all the smog. Or, no, I think there's somewhere else, Scunthorpe, no, don't say it, no. Um, <laughs> You know, it's like we're, we're, we're living in a place and the atmosphere is not great. And yes, we've got the down payment, but God has given us a, a prayer language that when we pray that prayer language, the whole, it activates the Holy Spirit to make an intercession for us. And what he does is he joins himself to us. He lifts us up and sets us against everything that's opposing you, everything that's against you, Everything, I mean everything. And I'll, I'll say this, look, the change doesn't happen in five minutes. It, do, it, take, it, it doesn't just happen in five minutes, right? It, be, it becomes a cycle. It becomes a lifestyle. I'm just aware of time, but honestly, this is such a precious, holy gift. Very quickly, in, in 1 Corinthians 14, the Apostle Paul quotes Isaiah. We'll look at this more in depth another time, but I just want to put this out there. The Apostle Paul quotes Isaiah when he speaks about tongues. 
He says, with people of stammering lips. And so the Apostle Paul's taking something from the Old Testament and pulling it into the new. Okay, fine. When you go and visit that part of the Old Testament, so Isaiah 28, 11, 12, it's actually talking about how God judged the unbelieving, cynical Jews, the unbelieving Jews, by putting them into Babylonian captivity. And he's effectively saying to them, Lord, you wouldn't listen to me, you wouldn't listen to my prophets, so I'm sending you to Babylon. These people that you don't understand, their foreign language, you're going to have to listen to me through them because I'm going to discipline you for 70 years through them. And to the Jews, who are very cultured, their language sounded barbaric. And so Paul takes that from the Old Testament, brings it into the New, and he says, tongues is a sign for unbelievers. And then he quotes that. I'm scratching my head. How was tongues a sign? Obviously, I've heard of times when people have spoken in tongues and others have heard it in their language. Obviously, Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit first fell, people could understand them. Ah, they're speaking Arabic. Ah, they're speaking Christian. If you read the narrative, though, the people's response was one of mockery and cynicism. And so the gospel message that Peter preached that day was as sharp as a razor. It cut their hearts. It was a harsh repentance message. So what's this sin? Tongues is a sign. Yes, it's a sign for a before. There's at least four different types of praying in tongues. Say that. There's, there's at least four different types of praying in tongues. So when it says do all speak in tongues, not everybody's going to speak in tongues that requires interpretation. Example. Or for a personal prayer language to edify your spirit, to build yourself up in your most holy faith. Yes. It's my sincere conviction that God wants every believer to have a personal prayer language. Absolutely. And tongues overall is a sign for unbelievers. It's not always a good sign, though. Because it's a sign, and what I mean, not always a good sign. It can expose the condition of the heart. That's why Paul lifted that scripture out of the Old Testament straight into the New it was in a negative connotation. And even on the day of Pentecost, the people responded negatively with cynicism and criticism. That's why under the anointing of the Spirit, they got their hearts. <sighs> they were begging to get saved. And so God has given this gift. Listen, God has given a gift, a prayer language. There are four di- at least four different types of praying in tongues. The Bible calls it diversities of tongues. Differences. And God in his wisdom, if it be look, if it were me, I would have done it some other way, guys. If I was God, I'd be just being honest, if it was me, I would have given something really refined, really sophisticated and refined. That would never offend anybody. Especially a vicar, a vicar of deadly type English Christianity and all that. I, I, that. That's me, but I'm not God. God has literally given a prayer language. The natural man can't get the things of the Spirit. Actually, he says they're foolishness. That's contempt. The natural man and the natural mind has contempt for the things of the Spirit. And this prayer language in the ears of the unbelieving and cynical is just a barbaric nonsense. It's what it is. And so I think, God, why? You, why do you set the, the bar like, you know, you just make things tough? No, no, he's God. He's God. I won't question God. But he's given us a prayer language and he's saying, look, we have a groaning on the inside of us. We've been given a down payment of heaven. We're living in a world full of pressure, full of containment. We're living in these bodies, with these minds, this brain that can be subject to depression, fear, anxiety. 
He's given us a prayer language. Access to a prayer language where the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. Paul said, when I pray, my spirit prays. Paul said, my spirit and the Holy Spirit are one. He was joined into the Lord. He's one spirit. He said, we, every Christian has a sense of, I need to pray, but I don't know how to pray. Have you ever felt inadequate? I don't know how to pray. Where do I start? That's normal. The God in his wisdom has given us a prayer language that bypasses the understanding. When you pray in the spirit, it bypasses your understanding. It bypasses your reasoning. It bypasses your emotions. And at some point, your emotions and your reasoning just put up the white flag and just go, okay. And you start to come into peace. You start to come into peace. Then the Lord, you can start, the scripture starts coming alive. Then you start hearing him. I'm going to have to bring this to a close just because of time. You know, I, 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 I felt as the Lord spoke to me yesterday about the language of the Holy Spirit. You know, on earth, I don't know how many languages there are in the earth. Or the, the group in the categories of languages, I believe. I'm not a linguistic, as you know. So the European languages are, I believe, are Latin based. Yeah? And then you've got your, your Chinese, I don't know, Mandarin, all these different languages. They're totally different from each other. Completely different. And I felt the Lord say, the language of the Spirit is mysteries. That's a Greek word. I don't mean mystery like woo, 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 like that mystery. Mysteries. And this is what happens when this is how God speaks. And let's be clear, when we want to hear God, it's not like we want to get some new doctrine. No, 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 no. Let's go to the word of God very quickly. It says here, he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. But no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. 1 Corinthians 14 2. Note. On the day of Pentecost, they spoke in tongues. People could understand them. Correct? In 1 Corinthians 14, 2, he says, When you speak in tongues, no man can understand you. Only God can. Is that a different type of praying in tongues? Yes or no? Correct. Yeah. Right, yes, the differences of tongues. When you pray in an unknown tongue, you are speaking mysteries to God. Direct to God. Your emotions won't feel anything. Your mind is probably telling you this is silly, this is silly. You say, carnal mind, be quiet. And you pray in the spirit and your spirit speaks mysteries straight to God. So you have an encrypted channel straight to God. And the devil can't get in on it. Man can't understand it. And the word mysteries means divine hidden secrets. The chapter before, 1 Corinthians 13. Hallelujah. It says in verse 2, If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries. Understand all mysteries. Listen. Now, Paul said this, listen. He said, I would that you all spoke in tongues, but I'd rather that you prophesy. To some people, that can sound like tongues is rubbish. Forget tongues, just go for prophecy. That's not what it's saying. In the language of the scripture... It's saying, when you pray in tongues, it's like a springboard in the prophecy. What is prophecy? Not everybody is in the office of a prophet. But all believers can prophesy. Prophecy is, basically, in a nutshell, prophecy is the mind of God now. It's the mind of God in the now. What happens when you're praying in the spirit, you're communicating mysteries in your spirit to God. Moses said all that all that all of God's people would prophesy. When your when mysteries are going from you to God, He starts sending mysteries back into you. Bam. Who's ever had that burning heart sensation? Oof. Who's ever had that? Does God spoke to you? You know, someone put it like this, this is how God speaks. We want God to speak like conversationally, like we speak. 
God's not going to, God, God, well, obviously God can do anything, but, but God, that's too slow. It's too slow. It's like this, and this is an amazing analogy. Have you ever seen one of those movies of a plant growing gradually? Someone put a, a camera in front of a plant over three months and filmed it growing. And then it's very slow, and then they speed it up. And you see the plant come out the ground. Grow. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. I saw a video once of somebody who was bald and his hair growing much. <laughs> Weird. Now, if God was to speak to us on our type of level, it would be too slow for him. It would be like... <laughs> so what does he do? He drops a zip file full. It's an encrypted zip file full of packets of revelation data. Bam! In the spirit in his presence. It's when you go from naught to, in naught point one seconds, you can understand something. Bam, just like that. Yes. That's how revelation works. In naught point one second, God can drop a revelation in your spirit. That's a mystery. That is a mystery of God. He can drop a, a naught point one of a second, drop a zip file in your spirit. Just like that, is, and it would take you six months to explain it to somebody. That's how God works. That's how God speaks. We've got to get on God's channel. I'm just digressing a little bit here. I think it's interesting. Hallelujah. I'm going to finish now. i just shut up. <laughs> Who wants to go to Middlesbrough? <laughs> Turn it into the Maldives. Glory, look, if anybody is, if anybody's listening to this message from Middlesbrough. <laughs> I once knew some guys that um, there was a mini revival in Middlesbrough. I got born again in 1996. I knew these guys that got saved from Middlesbrough. And all, the, like a mini revival started. It was amazing. Wow, God. Well, praise the Lord. Holy Spirit, we're hungry for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. I just want to pray. Again, listen, I don't want to alienate anybody who is, you know, it's okay to be in a place of not being sure. But I'm not quite there yet. That's all right. Well, let's have open hearts to the Spirit, you know. The epitome of being humble is being teaching. Yes, we want to search the Scriptures and see if these things are so. Of course we do. Well, let's be open with the Spirit because we are, you're living in your present reality. You live in your head. I don't live in your head. You don't live in mine. You have your struggles. You have your stuff. I've got mine. And it's like you don't even know who you are. And you would, we just don't know. We've been given this amazing down payment of heaven on the inside of us. And given the Spirit and given this language. This prayer language, guys, I just feel hungry to encourage you to get in the school of prayer. Come and join us on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday night. Get in the school of prayer. Don't expect, look, don't expect things in five minutes just to change. It's a, it takes, it's like a snowball. It's like a snowball effect. It builds and builds and builds and builds like a movement. And as you let the Spirit pray through you, it's like that snowball Affect this has grown. Father God, I just pray for these your people. This 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 time lift your hands to the Lord. This